Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33, 12. If that's true, which it is, the converse is true. Cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. If I have an opportunity to speak before a pastor's conference, I ask them the question, how many of your communities are more righteous than they were 25 years ago? I've never had a pastor raise a hand. What's going wrong? What's happening? Almost everyone understands the Bible speaks to the personal issues of life. They get that. Everyone understands the Bible speaks to the family issues. They get that. Everybody seems to understand the Bible speaks to the church or congregational life issues. They get that. What is not understood, I would contend, by 99% of Christians is the Bible speaks with great force and power to the issues of civil governance. After all, it's God who invented government. It's God who establishes nations. And I would contend to the extent that a nation will follow the biblical principles of governance, to that extent, the nation will reduce human pain, suffering, and poverty. In fact, to the extent a nation violates the biblical principles of civil governance, to that extent, it will increase human pain, suffering, and poverty. Show me a nation starving. They don't have water. I'll show you a nation that's violating biblical principles of governance. What's going on in our nation right now? What kind of condition are we in? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. What's happening to us? Three major problems. The first one, and it doesn't apply to your pastor or to your church, but silent pastors and silent pews. Let me just back that up with some facts. 90% of pastors, according to Barna's survey, agree the Bible speaks to the social political issues of the day. But when asked in that same survey, will you speak to the issues of the day, what the Bible says about them, 90% of pastors said, no, we will not. And therein lies the problem. There are 364 places of worship in our country. If you take out all those that are not Christian, those that are a Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist or Sikh or whatever, move them aside, that leaves us 344,000. If you remove the Catholic churches, because I don't know the research on the Catholic churches, that drops us to Protestant churches, that's 324,000. Protestant churches in America today. Of those, how many are by definition liberal, leftist, and not following the scripture? The answer is 72%. What percentage are following scripture? Are Bible believing, Bible teaching? The answer is 28%. That's about 100,000. Of those, based upon the eight categories of a biblical worldview, how many of those have a distinct biblical worldview? Don't know exactly, but probably around 15,000. Now you see why I so admire your pastor and this congregation. Some pastors will say, oh, I'm not political. I just preach Jesus. Well, so do I. I preach Jesus. But I not only preach Jesus, I preach what Jesus preached. What did he preach? The kingdom. What does the king have? Kingdom have a king. What is the king over? Everything. Everything, including the governmental political arena. But there's an attempt to silence us right now. They accuse us of Christian nationalism. Well, they accuse us of dominionism. dominionism. Well, they find some term to try to intimidate and bully us to not bring our biblical principles into the voting booth when they feel that they can. But there's another problem, not just silent pews, uh, pastors, but silent pews along with it. In the same survey done by Barna, it was revealed that lay people in the pew overwhelmingly said, we do not speak out on the issues. Now, I thought the survey would show we don't speak out on the issues because we're afraid. We're afraid of being labeled homophobe, transphobe, exonophobe, uh, Islamophobe, some phobe. That's what I thought they would say. Survey didn't bear that out. They said, we do not speak out on the issues because we do not know what to say. When I heard that, an explosion occurred in my heart. I wrote a book called Well Versed, same name as our ministry. Well Versed lays out the biblical foundations to 30 political topics. There is no topic God does not care about. More than abortion and marriage, though those are the foundational ones. Healthcare, welfare, minimum wage, social security, taxes, you name it. God has principles in his word that apply to how a nation is supposed to function. I don't make my living off of this. I sell it at my cost. Whatever I can get as an author's discount, I sell it at my cost because this is not how I make my income. My goal is to get it out by trying to to save the nation. I encourage you to buy them as many as you can. I encourage you to buy a case of them and hand them out to your relatives and your friends to help them understand my goal is so they think radically Jesus and biblical when they think in the governmental realm. Let me take you to the next step. By the way, you can get them, you get them cheaper if you get more of them and they're available, book, audio book, Kindle and all that. They tell me that they're getting close to running out after the first service. You, you, they bought way more than I anticipated, but we can always order them if they run out. The second issue is the wrong view of history. 
You've heard the phrase separation of church and state. Where did that come from? It's not in the Declaration of Independence, not in the Constitution. Where did it come from? The writings of Thomas Jefferson, January the 1st, 1802. You're a sophisticated crowd. Most of you already know this. He was writing to the Danbury Baptists. They were afraid that the government, federal government would come in and encroach upon the life of the church. He says, no, we can't because there's a wall of separation that prohibits the government from coming in and controlling the church in any way. What he did not say is that the church or religion could not come in and influence government. How do we know he did not say that? Because he didn't even think that way. How do we know that? Thomas Jefferson attended weekly Christian preaching and worship services in the U.S. Capitol, putting his Bible under his arm and writing as president of the United States down Pennsylvania Avenue to attend the weekly services in Statuary Hall, weekly services that continued from 1800 until 1869. At no time did this man, who so influenced the founding of our nation, ever suggest that there was anything wrong with those Christian worship services being there in this capital where the Marine Corps band furnished the worship music. There's another phrase that's come into our vocabulary recently, and that is the phrase Johnson Amendment. It comes from July the 2nd, 1954. Lyndon Baines Johnson, then senator before he became president, was returning from Texas after a hard-fought battle, and he, there was an overhaul of the tax code going through the Senate, and he stepped up and uh, submitted an amendment. They had a voice vote only, so we don't know how people voted, and there was zero discussion about it. And it passed and was put into law saying that a not-for-profit corporation, a 501c3, which includes all churches, could not oppose or endorse a candidate. The IRS jumped on that. But Johnson's chief legislative chief of staff admitted that we didn't have churches in mind. We were just angry at those two businessmen. We wanted to shut them down because they were using a 501c3 at the time. But the IRS jumped on it. So lawyers said, well, wait a minute, IRS. You're going to become police, pulpit police, dictate what a pastor can say or not say? You're going to follow that? Uh, how do we know if, if there are two candidates, for example, and one's pro-life and one's pro-abortion, and a pastor says, don't vote for pro-abortion, always vote for pro-life, is that not a de facto endorsement or opposition of a candidate? Would that be a violation of the Johnson Amendment? The IRS responded, we don't know. So years pass, and they intimidate and bully pastors across America, and even lay people in the pew begin to believe, oh, you should not do that. And so a group of attorneys, Alliance Defending Freedom, you all know Mike Ferris in this church, headquarters are just 10 minutes away. Alliance Defending Freedom gathered up pastors and said, we want you to intentionally defy, violate the Johnson Amendment. Thousands of us did it, recorded our sermons. We simply laid out, here's what we believe is true. We endorsed or opposed the candidate. We recorded our sermons and we mailed them to the IRS. The response from the IRS was we got postcards back saying, thank you, we received your sermon. <laughs> Somebody at the IRS had to be getting saved with all those good sermons. <laughs> I haven't seen any evidence of that yet, but what we wanted was a lawsuit. What we got was a postcard. And after thousands sent them in, not one church was sued. We wanted to be sued because we were convinced that's an anti-constitutional, unconstitutional amendment used to intimidate pastors from speaking out on issues that the Bible speaks out very clearly about. But there's a third issue, that's lack of the word. Let me explain it this way through an illustration. A pastor friend of mine, I'll call him Bill, not his real name. I pastored a large church at the time. He pastored a much larger church. He stood taller than me. One day he looked down at me both fig figuratively and, and physically. And he said, Jim, I'm not political like you. I said, Bill, my problem with you is not that you're not political. My problem with you is you're not biblical. Let me explain. If I were a slave, it was 1860, and I was in the South, would I want my slave owner to go to Bill's church or Jim's church? The answer is Jim's church because I will address the sin of racism as manifested in the institution of slavery and try to end it, put a stop to it. But to you, Bill, that would be political. Or if I was a baby in the womb of a 14-year-old girl living near Planned Parenthood, would I want that little, uh, that little girl, a scared teenager, to go to Bill's church or Jim's church? The answer is Jim's church, because I'll do everything I can to save uh, the life of that baby. Amen. But you won't, Bill, because that would be political. I said, Bill, I was ordained through the Wesleyan denomination, still am. As a matter of fact, our denomination was formed for the purpose of freeing the slaves. 
In 1836, at the Cincinnati General Conference, the Methodist Church decided slavery is too controversial. Let's not talk about slavery because it's political. It's, it's not expedient. We'll lose some members in the South. They'll leave and they'll take their tithe dollars with them. So let's just not discuss slavery anymore. A group of pastors said, no, we will not be silent. They left the denomination or were kicked out. They formed the Wesleyan Methodist Connection, now known as the Wesleyan Church. They formed it for the purpose of, of freeing the slaves. The churches in the South were a day's journey apart, part of the Underground Railroad, smuggling slaves out of the South into the North. In, in fact, they tarred and feathered, literally, some of our pastors, and they hung some of our laymen for standing for the biblical understanding of freeing the slaves. Makaija McPherson was hung. And there was a phrase in one county in South Carolina that says, we need this rope to hang another Wesleyan. I said, let me ask you a question, Bill. Was that political or was that biblical? That was biblical, but you would have been silent. Or what about the view of women? Women were treated like property. They couldn't even vote. Until 1848, the first Women's Right to Vote conference was held in Seneca Falls, New York, in a Wesleyan church. That pastor was accused of being political. Was he, Bill? No, he was being biblical. Senator James Langford once spoke and said that all the books of the Old Testament refer to government, about government, by government, something to do with government. I contacted him, I, I texted him and said, can, can I quote you on that? He said, well, I know 37 of the 39 are of the Old Testament. So I had a guy on my staff who's a brainiac. I said, hey, go through every book of the Bible. Find everything you can that refers to government, about government, for government, by government, in any way, any book. He came back and says, all 66 books cover the issue of government. I just want to make sure you pick up these books because God has the answer to how government is supposed to function. Or if you don't get this one, get one like this. I'm urging you to pray, 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 pray for those in elected officials. You can't pray for people if you don't know their names. I, I, I want to compliment this church. I'd never heard the phrase Loudoun County till recently. <laughs> now everybody knows it. And you and the epicenter of that, you led the way on that. Thank you for standing the way you did. You become an encouragement to all of us. You're really the epicenter of a, of, of a national, maybe international movement, and, and you surely, you must know that. I encourage you to make appointment with any elected official you can. Any elected official, any one of you, all of you, make an appointment with any elected official you can. Sit with them and say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you to understand God's way of how government's supposed to function. Because believe it or not, he's smarter than both of us. He has a way for us. I want to encourage you to make an appointment. Go as high up as you possibly can. Our ministry is called, is actually well-versed, and we try to bring the Word of God, biblical principles of governance to, to government leaders as much as we can. Our, meeting, our, our ministry is not a large ministry. It's a small ministry, so I'm not going to spin it and make it sound big. But we've had the privilege of meeting with a number of heads of state. I don't have the clout and connections to do that on my own. I have to do it with other people, friends who just get me connected. I praise God for that. But small groups of us have met with a number of leaders to help challenge them in biblical principles any way we possibly can. One of the great privileges was meeting with the president of, of Egypt, al-Sisi. He's a Muslim. And one of the things we have to learn as Christians is how to work with people who are not regenerate, part of our faith, at the same time, can get them to follow biblical principles of governance. There's a lot of people in leadership that are not regenerate. We understand it. We get that. They're not following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, regardless of what country we're talking about. But the goal is to see if they can follow biblical principles of governance to bless their nation. In this particular case, the president of Egypt is standing against the Muslim Brotherhood. He's rebuilding the Christian churches that have been burned down. He just dedicated one of the largest of all the worship centers in the Middle East. The prime minister of Kurdistan, Barzani. This is quite remarkable. They, they love America. They love freedom. They love liberty. These are Muslims who, who love Israel. They have deep respect for the Jewish people. This is an unusual group of people, the, the Kurds. Or, or Jordan. The Jordan was in war. But the king of Jordan is now a close friend with Israel. They battled Israel for a long time. Now they're close. In Israel, the former prime minister Netanyahu met with him three times. I don't defend every country, nor do I defend every decision made by every leader. But he's been a, a world-class leader on so many of the prime issues on the, on the global stage. Honduras, a more painful story. He's been accused of some things recently. I don't believe his accusers, but I don't know the whole story. But try to bring biblical principles anytime you can. Or let's go to Brazil, Yair Brazil. This is a remarkable man, baptized in the Jordan River in Israel. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of God said to him, you're going to become the president of Brazil. He started his campaign. He was stabbed. He had to run his, his whole campaign from a hospital bed with a cell phone. 
He was deeply harmed by the, by the stabbing and has gone through lots, lots of surgeries. He's called the Trump of the tropics. The pressure on him is enormous. Just met with him not too long ago. Pretty staggering pressure that is on, on this man. He faces a tough election in October and Brazil could flip and become a Venezuela overnight. Pray for Yahir Bolsonaro. In Guatemala, Jimmy Morales had a background something like Trump's. But God got a hold of him as a leader and he started leading the country in the right ways on the definition of marriage and saving life in the womb. And then the next president, Alejandro Giamatti, he's not one of us by any stretch of the imagination, but God is using him. He's fully aware of the biblical principles of governance. I would contend of the nations of the earth that probably, uh, I would probably have the 193 nations on the earth that probably this is the second most biblically grounded grasp of understanding of, of, of government right now against enormous pressure from the, from the U.S. They're standing for life in the womb. They're standing for the definition of marriage. I mean, I'm talking enormous pressure upon this small country. Take Bolivia, another example. The socialists were finally voted out of power after a prayer meeting. A prayer meeting started in the streets several years ago. It went to a million and a half in the streets. You can Google and read the story, it's staggering. And, it, and that, that when the dictator finally fled, he, he, with his second man, third man, fourth man, fifth man, all left in succession. It went six down in succession, and Janine Añez, an unknown senator, became president of the country overnight. Godly woman, her, her brothers, the evangelical pastor. But the socialists came back into control a year later, threw her into prison, trumped up false charges, and just charged her with 10 years in prison. She's almost died recently. Pray for Janine Añez. This is a godly woman who's been falsely accused and suffering a great deal in prison, in Hungary, Victor Orban. I would contend this country probably has the most biblically grounded government in the world. Look at Tristan Asbe. You know what his task is as state secretary? His task is to find persecuted Christians anywhere in the world and try to save their lives. That's his task. In addition to that, this is a government that so believes, so, so believes in the issue of marriage and family, marriage and family, in the rest of Europe that doesn't regard it, except for just two or three countries that stand firm, the rest of them mock him for this. Marriage and family, marriage of a man and a woman. And so what do they do if you'll get married and have babies? After you have two babies, they'll cancel half your student debt. If you have three, they'll cancel all your student debt. If you'll buy a house and have babies, they'll help pay for the house. If you'll, get a, if you'll have babies, they'll give you a van if you'll fill it with babies. <laughs> That's a good economic policy, and some of you right now want to move to Budapest, I can tell. <laughs> Ukraine, tough country, a lot of challenges. But the man in the middle, Pavel Hungarian, youngest man ever elected their parliament, has helped lead a, a profound revival in, in that country. Donald Trump, I can't defend all his mean tweets, but I know this, he tried to do what was right in terms of biblical principles of governance. I served on his faith board. <laughs> along, It was an honor to serve with about 40 others on, on the Trump Faith Advisory Board. Let me turn the, turn the tables on this a little bit. Now, what is the universal challenge right now happening all over the entire globe on the whole issue of, of, of God versus the evil force? What is it? It's the definition of marriage. Every, every country you go to, the attack on marriage. Divorce is attacking marriage. Pornography attacks marriage. Homosexuality attacks marriage. Transgenderism attacks marriage. Every institution, entertainment is attacking marriage. The sports industry is now attacking marriage. Media is attacking marriage. Now the government is attacking marriage. Half the, half the so-called church in America is attacking marriage. Why? What is it about this one institution? So wonderful, a man and a woman. How can they, how can they be attacking marriage so severely? Let me walk you through some questions. Here we go. Let me ask you this. Was God male or female? The answer is neither. The scripture writers define God using terms of strength as masculine. They use terms of tenderness uh, and nurture, uh, femininity. They'll talk about him being muscular and mighty. They'll talk about him having a, a breast that feeds a newborn or a womb that gives birth. So the writers describe the whole gamut. In fact, the term El Shaddai, a name for God, El, mighty like a mountain, Shaddai, a breast that nourishes, depicts exactly this. That means that no male by himself is a full expression of the full spectrum of the image of God. No female by herself is a full representation of the full spectrum of the image of God. It's only in sexual attraction as the two complementary halves of humanity come back together in the institution of marriage. The two complementary halves of humanity come together and form a one. Now they represent the image of God, which includes not only God's creativity, but the procreativity of a man and a woman coming together in the institution of marriage. 
Let me challenge and stretch us a little bit in our traditional view of God's invention of marriage. We tend to think God created Adam, capital A, pulled out a, a, a rib and got Eve. That sounds like it from the English. I want to take you into the Hebrew. And here's what it actually bears out. Genesis 2, verse 7. God created not capital A, Adam. The word there is Adam. It means humanity. So God created Adam, humanity. Don't think capital A, Adam. Think small a. He created Adam, humanity. He took one look at that and he says it's not good. It's the only time God ever looked at something he created and said it's not good. Why is it not good? It has no capacity for relationship because it's alone or as one. And so Genesis 2, 21 and 22, we have what's called the splitting of the atom. By splitting of the atom, I mean he took apart, the word is not rib. The word there is tesela in the Hebrew. That is properly translated half or side, never rib. God pulled aside the side or the half. The word is sela. He pulled it aside. Now we have femininity. Now we have masculinity. Part of the power of the attraction of male for female is that desire to be a representation of the full spectrum of the image of God and come back together. Now let me take you to the Hebrew word specifically. Bring up the screen if I can and watch this right now and you'll see how it makes more sense. The top word is the word for man, ish. In Hebrew, you read from right to left, Aleph, Yod, Sheen. Repeating, Aleph, Yod, Sheen. The next word is Isha, woman. Aleph, Sheen, Hey. You know the story, don't you? Adam took one look at Eve and went, whoa, man, and is stuck, woman. And three of you like that joke, let's go on. And Eve took one look at Adam and went, ish, and it stuck, okay. Now, what do we have? Look at the top line. What's the one letter in the top line that's not in the second? It's the middle letter, Yod. Think of the letter Y. Yod. What's the one letter that's in the second line that's not in the top? It's He. Or think of H. If you take those letters out, Yod, He, take them to the bottom, that forms the word, the rudimentary of Lord or God or, or Yahweh. Now, keeping that in mind, let's go to the next screen. Here we go, the next screen. We're going to take the Yod, look at the upper right-hand corner. Take the letter Yod in that blue line and take it down and put it in the blue box. Now take the He at the end of woman, bring it down. And now we have Yod He Vav He. That's the name for Yahweh or Lord or God. It's used 6,800 times in your Old Testament. Two women cannot produce Yod He, the mark of God. Two men cannot produce that. It says a male and female come together in covenantal marriage that the very name of God is stamped on who they are. Amen. Now let's go to the next one. Let's repeat this. yod Hey at the top, God or Lord. Bring it down on the right. You see it there in the middle of the word man. Bring down the hey on the, on the other side. Bring it down to the end of the word woman. Aleph, Sheen, hey. And now you have the word for woman. yod Hey. God's name is stamped up on them. The image of God is written right into the name man and woman. But if you remove yod Hey from that, all you have is Aleph Shin at the bottom. That's the word for fire. Now, let me ask you, is fire good or bad? Well, it depends. Fire that's unleashed and not controlled can be very, very bad. In 2003, we had a fire break out in San Diego where I live, and it took out 2,800 homes in four days. Uncontrollable, could not stop it. But fire contained is good. It runs a PA system, the lighting system, your air conditioning, your heating, the ignition on your car, the meals that you cook. Fire properly contained is a good thing. The fire, the sexual energy between a male and female, uncontrolled lust, will destroy everybody in its pathway. But properly contained within the framework of marriage, it is a godly, righteous act. Let's go to the next slide. Now here we're gonna do a review. A top line is woman, isha. Look at that hay at the end of it. The next line is man, ish. Look at the yod in the middle of it. We take the yod and hay, and now we have the rudimentary form of Yahweh God, or as it appears mostly in your Bible, the word Lord. If we remove yod hay, we have ish, or fire. Now, keeping all that in mind, let's go to the next slide of what God has written into his word in the Hebrew scriptures. The word covenant is berit. Berit, think, don't think of a contract that can be broken. Think of a covenant of marriage that cannot be broken. 
Now I'm gonna take the two right hand letters and slide them over. I'm gonna take the two left hand letters and slide them to the left. And I'm gonna put a word in the middle of it and watch what happens. Next slide. And here we have the word Bereshit. Now look at the top. There's the word Berit for covenant, the covenant of marriage. And look at the bottom. We have Ish, the word for fire. If we put fire, that sexual energy we talked about, that sexual attraction we talked about, but put it in the context of the covenant of marriage, this word is Bereshit. Now, where does that word appear in your Bible? That is the first word of your Bible. Bereshit is the very first word in your Bible. It's translated in the beginning. Everything I'm teaching you right now was taught to me by three Jewish rabbis. And the Jewish rabbi who told me this said, Jim, God is so passionate about the institution of marriage, the powerful attraction he's created between the two complementary halves of Adam that were split apart, coming back together and that expression, the righteousness of that expression in the, with the parameters of a covenant that he actually tucked that into the very first words of all of scripture in the beginning. But if I were the enemy, if I were Satan, I would want to destroy the image of God on earth. Oh, but there'd be more I'd want to do if I were Satan. Let me take you from Genesis. Genesis starts with the marriage of a man and a woman and Revelation ends with a marriage of a bride and a groom. What is history headed for? All of history is headed for one thing. All of history is headed for one thing. The culmination of history is the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're headed, all of history is headed towards one big event, a wedding. It's the wedding of the son. This, this, this father only has one boy. He only got one kid. And who his kid's gonna marry, he cares about. Jesus is gonna marry the church. Jesus is gonna marry the covenanted people of God. And God wants us ready to be married to his kid. All of history is going towards that one event. Now, we tend to think that God looked down on planet Earth and said, hmm, there's marriages. They all understand marriages. So I'm going to borrow the metaphor of marriage, and I'm going to use that metaphor to describe the closure of history with my son Jesus and the church coming together as one. That's not the way it happened. It's the opposite. It's the flip side. The marriage of Jesus and the covenant people of God is capital M marriage. You've never seen real marriage yet. Now the hors d'oeuvres or the appetizer course is small M marriage. That's the marriages on earth. Think of the best marriage you can. I hope it's your own. Think of the best marriage you can. That marriage is to be a depiction to help other people understand the closure of history. That's one of the major purposes for marriage. How do we know that? Ephesians chapter five. Paul says, husband, treat your wives this way. Wife, respond this way. Husband, wife, husband, wife, husband, wife. And then he throws a curveball at verse 32. He says, hey, I bet you think I'm talking about husbands and wives. I'm not. It's a mystery. Verse 32. What's a mystery? Jesus and the church come together. You and I can't grasp it. I cannot grasp how, what's it look like with Jesus and the people of God getting married? I can't picture it. But I can look at a wedding. I can look at a marriage. I can look at a husband and wife. And all of a sudden, I figure it out. It makes sense to me a little bit. I've written some books on heaven. I've written two books on heaven and the afterlife. So people will say to me sometime, well, wait a minute, why, why is there no marriage in heaven? I say, are you kidding me? Heaven is marriage. It's one big marriage party. That's what it's all about. I, I've written books on, on marriage and people say, well, why is there no, so sexual, no sexual expression in marriage? We interviewed, for the two books I wrote on marriage, we interviewed people who had had near-death experiences. They crossed over, experienced heaven, and then came back. Without exception, correction, with only one exception, with only one exception, not one person who crossed over wanted to come back. Every one of them wanted to stay there. Uh, on top of that, every single person who had come back after experiencing heaven for those few moments, however long it was, not a one of them had one bit of fear of death ever again. And they would try to describe to us what heaven was like, what it was like seeing Jesus, what it was like being in the presence of Jesus. They said, every leaf has light and music coming out. Every blade of grass has light and music. They said, you can't believe that the ecstasy, the joy is indescribable being in the presence of Jesus. The physical ecstasy of the act of marriage of a husband and wife coming together in physical union is a representation of the sheer joy and delight of what it's like to be in the presence of Jesus. Let me rewind that. The gift of physical expression in the act of marriage 
intimacy in marriage, that joy, that ecstasy in that moment is a physical depiction of the spiritual reality of the joy and delight it's gonna be like to be in the presence of Jesus. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. In fact, we use marital bed language to describe the, the consummation of history, the consummation of history, the climax of history. But if I were Satan, I would want to destroy marriage. This is not an issue of Republican versus Democrat or right versus left. This issue is an issue of right versus long, wrong. This is an issue of God versus Satan. This is an issue of all things good versus all things evil. This is not just a little political struggle defending marriage. This is the entire cosmos is struggling with this because the, the desire of the enemy is to destroy the image of God on the entire earth in Genesis and then in Revelation to keep you from being able to understand what it would be like the joy of being in the presence of Jesus. Now, one might mistakenly assume my sermon is designed to help encourage you to become a political activist. That's a good thing, but that's not the purpose of my sermon. Or you might be thinking a political operative. No, that's a good thing, but that's not. Or to become identified with a party and, and being an activist. No, or, or become a conservative. Well, that's a good thing. Or, or a patriot. Well, that's a good thing, but that's not at all to do with my sermon. My dream and desire of this sermon is for us to realize that God is so smart and so loving. He filled his book with how civil governance is supposed to function. And we should never be bullied and intimidated out of that. And we have the right to go into the voting booth and take Jesus. We have the right to go in the voting booth and take a mind that's filled with the word of God. In fact, my desire would be that our hearts and spirits will be so saturated with God's word on these issues, not just all the other issues we know we should be, but the actual principles of civil governance. And our spirit would link it up with our tongue and our tongue would speak about God's wisdom in this arena. My, you're not particularly dangerous to the enemy, a Democrat, Republican, or independent, or conservative, or, or patriot, or whatever. All, those are going to all be okay. But that's not what intimidates the enemy. What intimidates the enemy is when you're filled with the love of Christ, and you're filled with the Spirit of the living God, and you take His Word. His Word goes forth, and it never comes back null and void. And you fill your heart with His Word, and you declare that over the situations in your community. That's what makes the difference, and that's why I've come today. That being the case, I've got to wrap up with this. My goal is to make sure that there is not one person that walks out of this auditorium today without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt. If you were to die today, you would go to heaven. You probably have a lot of life left in you, but you don't know that for sure. But I want to make sure you live this life full of Jesus and the life with him for eternity. And there might be one person who could honestly say, I do not know whether or not if I were to meet my maker today, I would be able to go into his heaven. There's only one reason why he should allow you into his heaven. You'd point to the cross of Jesus. And for you, I'm gonna take this moment to explain how to become a follower of Christ so that you can be filled with Jesus in this life. You can be a threat to Satan here and now and deliver the goods in holiness and righteousness and truth and biblical justice. And you can know him for eternity. And that is when you pray a simple prayer, inviting him into your life, repenting of sin, and become a follower of Christ. I'm going to ask every person to bow your head right now. No one looking around. Every person to bow your head. Austin, join me up here if you would. I'm going to pray this simple prayer. If this describes the desire of your heart, right where you are, pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I ask you to make me the kind of person you want me to be. Father, I repent of sin. I turn from my sin. I long to be all that you, ha that you have for me. Become my safe. Save me from myself and become Lord in charge, boss of my life. I yield my life to you this moment. In the name of Jesus, I pray. No one looking around, all eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer with me, just wave your hand. Raise your hand high and just wave it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now keep them up in the air. Wave them. Okay, those of you with your hands in the air, would you look at me? Everybody else, keep your eyes closed. There's quite a bunch of you with your hands in the air. Look at me. If you prayed that prayer, when the service is over, Austin, I want you to tell them where they can go to get some help and what pastor they can talk to and how they can get material. Austin, go ahead and come on over here. I say to those of you that raised your hand and prayed that prayer, way to go. That's the most important decision you have ever made. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you. Thank you.